Hi, I'm Alex Sudris, and thanks for joining us for tonight's Bold Method Live Pro Pilot Edition. Tonight, we're going to be talking about jet engine performance, specifically cruise performance, and why jet engines, whether they're a turbofan or a turbojet, have completely different cruise performance characteristics than a prop-driven airplane, whether it's a turboprop or a reciprocating driven aircraft. If you had the same platform, the same airplane, and you strapped jet engines on one and prop engines on the other, even if they had the same output on the ground standing still, as soon as they started flying and climbing, they would have completely different performance characteristics. And that all comes down to how they generate thrust and power and how that affects their cruise performance. So that's what we're gonna focus on. We'll start by looking at the jet engine and how it operates, just a quick refresher. And then we'll get into what governs a jet's cruise performance, essentially the thrust required curve. And we'll look at how that changes with altitude and how that affects cruise performance. And then we'll talk about some factors that affect a jet engine's or a turbo pro or turbo fan or turbo jet's efficiency and how that changes with air density factors. And then finally, we'll take a look at where a jet aircraft's optimum altitude would be and some hazards that show up there that are unique to turbojet or turbofan aircraft. This is the kind of stuff that you'll see on your ATP written. If you're taking a regional airline interview, you may find these questions. And I know some of the majors ask them as well. So if you're getting into a pro pilot career, uh, this is some basic jet knowledge that you can apply basically to any jet A, jet Fan, or a jet uh, turbofan or turbojet airplane, and it should help you out on your way. So um, tonight we have Corey Cormeric on the chat. Uh, he'll be looking for your questions and then forwarding those to Colin Cutler, who's our technical director. He'll be bringing them online. So if there's anything you want me to go into more detail on, if there's something you don't understand, throw out a question in chat, and then we'll work it into tonight's show. And with that, uh, let's start by taking a look at a basic jet engine. Okay, uh, to the iPad. What you can see here, this is kind of uh, the kind of jet engine that you might see on an ERJ-145, basically a 14-stage compressor jet engine. And if we start to look at this, you can see we have cold or normal air coming in through the front, and it hits the fan, um, the turbofan. The most modern jet-powered aircraft are turbofan aircraft, so that's your fan right there. And that fan compresses air. It pushes air behind it. And that air, most of it, flows around the outside of the engine. We call this bypass air. And that generates a significant amount of the thrust on our turbofan airplane. But some of it ends up going into the engine's core, into the compressor section. As it moves into the compressor section, it passes through additional stages, essentially of fans or compressors that are spinning. And as it moves through each stage, it gets more and more dense. It's compressed. Essentially, the same amount of air is packed into less and less space. And you can see it starts to change basically from cool blue to orange all the way to red because as it's moving through that core and as it's getting compressed, the air's warming up. As you decrease the volume but keep the mass the same, it's going to get warmer and warmer and warmer. And once it exits the very last stage of compression, it's at its maximum pressure it's mixed with fuel. At that point in time, essentially is burned. Initially, there are some igniters to start the burning process, but then those aren't necessary. It just keeps burning as air flows through. That's what you could call the hot section. It moves through that section and expands. You've got a ton of air all packed into a small space, really dense air so it can accept a lot of fuel. It's burned and it quickly expands out. So it's coming out right through those turbine blades. The turbine blades actually suck a little bit of energy out of the air, but they're what's spinning both the compressors and the fan on the front. And so as that uh, expanding air moves out the back of the engine, it starts to cool, it starts to slow down, but eventually it exits the back of the jet to create additional thrust. So when you're talking about a turbofan, which you'll find on almost any modern airplane, even fighter jets, most of the air is bypass air. Most of the thrust is from that bypass air but still a large and significant amount of thrust comes from the core of the engine exiting out the back. So there's a couple limits that all jet engines kind of run into. Um, and they're, they're not too far different, the propeller driven limits. It's just, they kind of happen in different ways. And really when you look at a jet engine, the function between a jet engine and a reciprocating engine and a turboprop engine, it's the same. You're compressing air 
then you're throwing in something that'll create energy. It's, it's um, kinetic energy until we burn it, and then it's creating dynamic force, okay? So we heat it up by burning fuel, and it expands out the back. It's the exact same thing that's happening in, in a reciprocating driven aircraft or in a turboprop. But in a turbofan or a turbojet, all of that fuel is basically generating a direct rearward force. And that's why they're considered thrust producing engines. As we start to add fuel to a turbofan or a turbojet, it's going to just produce more rearward force. Yes, the compressors can start to spin faster, but that's not what's, what's actually generating the force. It's the expansion of gas coming out the back. When you compare that to a turboprop or a reciprocating driven aircraft, you know, like our Cirrus, when we burn fuel, yeah, there is exhaust coming out of the bottom of the Cirrus, but it doesn't generate any noticeable thrust. What it does do is pump those pistons up and down, connecting rods hooked to the crankshaft, spin the crankshaft. So as we add more fuel in a reciprocating driven airplane, like the Cirrus, what we're doing is not pushing harder, we're just spinning the crankshaft faster. So we're not generating more force, we're generating more power. And the difference is force is just that, that pure physical force. Power is force over time. So on a reciprocating driven airplane, as we throw more fuel into the engine, we're generating the same amount of force, we're just doing it in a lot less time. We're spinning that crankshaft faster. So a reciprocating driven airplane, which are most props, um, is a pure power producing airplane. A turboprop still is running Jet A, but it does not produce much thrust coming out of the back of the exhaust. It does produce some, uh, but it's not a lot. Most of it is still going right into that crankshaft. And so because of that, even a turboprop is considered a power producing airplane. It's not producing thrust directly. As we start to get into turbojets, where you don't have that big fan on the front, you'd have to find like an old fighter jet to find one of these, um, or a turbofan, which you're gonna see on most aircraft today, most uh, jet powered aircraft today. They're called thrust producing aircraft because natively as we dump more jet A into them, they just generate more rearward force. And yes, if you look at a turbofan, a lot of that, or some of that energy is going through the compressor or the, uh, the turbines to spin that front fan. So you could say, well, isn't that power? And it is a little bit, it absolutely is. They're kind of a mix of power and thrust, but we can group them into the thrust producing engines because their characteristics are much more like thrust. So as we talk about turbofans and turbojets, they are different, they have some different characteristics, but we're really just looking at them as pure thrust producing engines. Okay, back to uh, the iPad. Let's talk about some limits that you could have on this. Well, first of all, you're gonna have a lot of pressure right here with all of that expansion. And Alex, if you could restart the app, uh, the drawing stopped on. Oh, there. give me one second. Actually, I think the airplay dropped. Are we back? Good. I think you're good. Look at that. Little, little in-show maintenance. Okay, so right here in the center of this engine, okay, right, I'm gonna draw that in a little tighter, right here. We're still not getting the drawing. You want still to not getting the drawing. Kill okay. the app and, uh, and uh, restart the airplane. Yeah, let's do that one more time, and I can plug in if we need to. We'll go back to you as well. Okay, give me one second. Okay, let's try drawing here. <laughs> no joy. Okay, uh, let's see. Let me try in a different one. Give me one second. Still nothing, huh? Okay, let's do this. Oh, there we got it. Did you? Yep. Just going to leave it closed for a second. Nothing? 
Seems to be. There we go. Now we're good. Is it running? Yep. Hey, you can see that too. Okay, great. So we'll get back into this. So we're talking about some limits on the jet engine. And if you look right here, well, all that, the fuel burn and the expansion and the maximum pressure coming off of the or air density coming off the compressor blade is, that's where you're going to get the most pressure in a jet engine. And so a jet engine could be limited by the amount of pressure here. Too much pressure to blow the engine apart. Okay, so that's going to be a problem. Just like, and, and the same thing, cylinder pressures on a reciprocating airplane, kind of analogous. The rate that these are spinning, that's also possibly a limitation. Okay, now jet engines fit, spin at much faster RPM than props, you know, 30,000 RPM oftentimes, but there is still a limit. So they could be RPM limited. And then finally, uh, this is something that we have even on a turbocharged airplane. This air coming off of the combustion chamber is extremely hot. And so we have a turbine inlet temperature, TIT. And that is the temperature as the heated air hits the very first turbine. And that's, that can get so hot that it would actually melt your turbine section. In fact, it, it is hot enough in some jets to cause damage to the turbine blades, but those blades have little air holes inside of them and they actually blow cooling air around them to kind of create a sheath and keep the turbine section cooler. But there's a maximum turbine inlet temperature. And so you don't want to exceed that. So if you think about it, we got a couple limits. We got that pressure limit, we got the turbine inlet temperature limit, and We've got the speed of the, air, of the, of the um, compressors in the fan as well, which is a limit. We call that an N1 limit. And if you notice, as we're looking at this, as soon as the air starts coming in, it's getting heated, warmer and warmer and warmer. And then it's heated again with fuel. So the warmer the air is as it comes into the jet, the less we can hit it, heat it before it starts to overtemp and reach uh, exceed that turbine inlet, turbine inlet temperature. So those are the three limits. We're going to talk about those in detail in a second so you can understand that. But let's start um, by taking a look at how the jet engine's performance is going to change with altitude. And this is a pretty typical modern jet engine. Now, we've come up with some fake thrust numbers, I think typical of a regional jet. Um, but any turbofan our turbo jet engine will kind of react like this, any modern one. You'll notice initially, as we climb, thrust doesn't change. And that's because almost, you know, all modern turbo fan engines are what we call flat rated or derated. And what that means is the engine's capable of producing more thrust than the manufacturer wants you to have. So they're gonna rate it down. And the advantage is that thrust output won't change on the engine as the air gets warmer or as it climbs. It's basically going to stay the same. At some point in time, the power output of the engine will start to drop, and we'll talk about that in a second. But essentially, a flat-rated engine maintains a constant output of thrust as you climb up to a specific altitude or air density. Okay, looks like we got a question. Okay, we're going to start tonight off with Jake, and he wants to know, are D-rated or flat-rated engines only affected by temperature in their thrust output? Okay, so that's kind of a common thing to think about, um, because when we talk about D-rated or flat-rated engines, um, we also oftentimes start talking about reduced thrust takeoffs. So on, on modern jet engines, uh, on modern jets, when they take off, they're not going to actually take off at full power. Uh, they take off at reduced power. And you don't do that oftentimes by pulling those thrust levers back. What you do is you fake out the system. And what you do is you, you enter an OAT that is extremely hot. And what that does is it tells the FADEC computer, the, the computer that runs the jet engine, oh man, we got a ton of hot air coming in, so I can't heat it as much. Otherwise, I'm going to damage my turbine, my turbine section. My TIT will get too hot. And so it reduces the thrust output of the engine at your maximum takeoff setting. But the reality is a flat rated or derated engine is affected by air density, just like an old school, you know, it goes as hard as you'll push it jet engine. And that's because 
as air density starts to decrease, at some point, it's not going to be able to compress that air enough to generate the full rated or derated power on the engine. At some altitude or at some, some point, there's just not enough air pressure there. It can't spin fast enough. It'll hit that RPM limit and it's going to start to run out of power. So if we take a look at this, we'll go back to the chart and you can see that happening at some altitude, you know, and, and that altitude depends on the outside air conditions, the pressure and the temperature that day. But let's say maybe this is 10,000 feet. That could be kind of an ideal altitude for some engines. As you start to climb, the maximum thrust output of the engine will start to decrease. And normally this isn't much of a problem because you're not operating at your maximum thrust output when you're flying. But at some point in time, you're gonna to get to the point where the jet engine cannot generate thrust. And so why is that? Well, if we think about it, there's a couple things that are happening. As we climb in altitude, as you get higher, the air becomes less dense, okay? So less dense air, if we go back to that jet engine diagram, Okay, what's going to happen with less dense air? Well, we can try spinning the compressors faster to compress the air more, and that works up to a point, but eventually you reach 100% of N1, you can't spin those compressors any faster. And that less dense air was going to result in less compressed or less mass coming out of the very end of your compressor section. So now you have less air and less oxygen to burn, and the jet's thrust output's gonna to start to drop. And there's no way to avoid this. You know, at some point in time on any flat rated or derated jet powered engine, whether it's a turboprop, a turbofan, or a turbojet, at some point in time, the air density is gonna to drop to a point or at maximum N1 or at maximum RPM, it just can't compress the air enough anymore and the thrust output starts to drop. So looking at this, you know, going back to the flat rated thrust design here, you'd say, well, okay, so the problem is, is we get higher, thrust output drops, so flying down low looks like it would be better, right? If you stayed low, maybe somewhere below where you're at full thrust. But the reality is, that's almost the furthest, furthest thing from the truth. And before we get into that, we'll take one more question. Okay, so next question, John S. wants to know, uh, do all flat rated engines start losing power or thrust at the same altitude? That's a great question. And the answer is no. There's a lot of reasons why an engine could be flat or derated. Um, part of it could be the engine itself. Um, part of it could be the airframe that it's attached to. The engine could generate so much thrust or torque that it would actually damage the pylon or the wing or its attached point on the airplane. So uh, the manufacturer of an engine for a specific aircraft may have a specific flat or D rating so that it doesn't damage the aircraft. And the advantage here to doing this, um, it's not just that you can have a lot of power without damaging the airplane, but it's that the airplane can get maximum thrust if it needs it for takeoff up to some altitude. And if you think about it, you know, takeoffs all occur, you know, I would say less than 8,000 feet uh, DA, you know, Leadville uh, is at 9,007, and, or not, um, Telluride's at 9,007, and Leadville's just below 10,000, but you don't see a lot of jet engine aircraft going in there. But the advantage to flat rating that engine is you can keep the engine's power output down so it doesn't damage the airplane, but as you lose air density, you still get maximum thrust out of the engine. So you still get all your takeoff and climb performance up through some altitude. And when I say 10,000 feet, you know, it's a generalization. It could be well above that or even below that depending on outside conditions. And it is completely different for each engine and the airframes possibly that they're installed on. So that's kind of the thing there. Okay, so let's take a look at how a jet's performance starts to change, cruise performance starts to change. And we'll start by looking at how cruise, cruise performance in a jet is computed. And so we're gonna take a look at the drag curve. So this is your basic drag curve. It's also your thrust required curve because thrust is the opposite of drag. So this big thick blue line, this is both your total drag curve and your thrust required curve. And we've drawn um, at the top in the thin blue line, your thrust available line. You'll notice in a jet, it's essentially flat. 
Um, it's not completely flat. It actually does dip a little bit here, but it's such a small amount, it's not really noticeable. And different jet designs might have different variations, but essentially, it's flat. If you compare this to a uh, propeller-driven turbofan or turboprop, they kind of look like that for uh, thrust available as you speed up. But a jet is gonna generate the same amount of thrust as it continues to speed up. Okay, so how does this drag curve show up? Well, the drag curve is made up of our two types of drag. So we've got induced here, you can see this gray line, okay? And at speeds below, and I think some of you recognize this is L D max. So essentially your lift to drag max or your lowest drag point. It speeds below LD max, induced drag makes up the most of your drag. And that's because induced drag is generated by angle of attack and the production of lift. Induced drag happens when you've got that high pressure on the bottom of the wing and the low pressure on top, and you end up with those wingtip vortices, that creates your induced drag. So the more angle of attack, the more the pressure difference, as you go slower and slower and slower to maintain altitude, the more induced drag you have. Of course, if you think about it, we really never try to fly on the back side of the power curve. We call it that. Uh, you're really never operating there. Um, and we'll go back to the iPad. You can see at that point, parasite drag, the opposite, it's pretty low, right? Parasite drag is caused by the shape of the airplane and the friction on the aircraft's skin, the interference between the joints and angles. Uh, it's also caused by maybe cooling drag coming through the engines. Um, but at low speeds, there's not a lot of air pressure against the airplane, so parasite drag is pretty low. Of course, as we speed up, parasite drag becomes more and more of a factor. And induced drag becomes less and less of a factor because our angle of attack keeps dropping. Well, the interesting thing with a, um, if you wanna look at your maximum endurance for a jet, you wanna look at the point where you're going to burn the least amount of fuel. And fuel is directly related to thrust in a jet. So essentially, we're looking for the point where the jet needs the least amount of thrust. So that's maximum endurance. And on a jet-powered airplane, because it's a thrust airplane, um, it's going to be right at LD max. Your maximum range is a little bit different. Uh, and really what we want to look for is the most velocity for the least amount of thrust, right? Because it's essentially then the most speed for the least fuel. And when you chart that, there's a really easy way to find that, and that's to draw a tangent line. You start at the origin, and you just draw it up until it just tangents or touches the curve. And at that point, you're getting the most velocity for the least amount of thrust, or essentially the most speed for the least amount of fuel. That is your maximum range speed. Now, when you think about it in a prop airplane, uh, we really never fly at our maximum range speeds. Um, they're basically LD max, and we're way faster than that on a prop-powered airplane. So we're operating fairly inefficiently in cruise. If a jet is allowed to fly its speed, its preferred speed, ATC has not assigned a speed, or they're not slowing for you know, delays ahead or anything like that, a jet's probably not going to be at best range, but it's going to be really, really close. The speed difference isn't vast. Jets operate really close to their best range speed. And that's one of the advantages for long distance flight in a jet. They're operating essentially in cruise at their perfect fuel efficiency. So that's why you see jets, you know, they've overtaken turboprops and props. It's not just that they're faster, it's that they're designed to be much more efficient in cruise. Okay, so let's take a look at what happens as we start to increase altitude. That's the big variation you'd see with a jet, right? So we'll go back to the iPad. Okay, so this is the same chart. We just compacted it down a little bit. You can see that tangent line is drawn there, but this is still the same thrust required curve, except we're at sea level. And so now we're gonna start to climb and you're gonna see that curve kind of flattens out and it shifts to the right. Okay, so let's take a look at this. First of all, when we talk about our velocity here, we're talking about true airspeed, not indicated airspeed. This is true airspeed. And so what's happening is, as we go higher in altitude, we have less density than you may have here, right? So the air is thinner, right? And here it's thicker. 
And so essentially, because that air is thin at slow speeds, we need to fly at higher angles of attack. Okay, so because the air is thinning out, if we're on the backside of the power curve, we have to increase our angle of attack, and that means we end up with more induced drag. But on the front side, what you see as you go up, this thin air causes less pressure against the airplane. So if we go back to the, just the, the um, jet range, as we decrease air density, this parasite drag curve here actually starts to drop because there's less pressure for a given true airspeed, a given actual speed through the air acting on the airplane. So as you go higher, for a certain true airspeed, you have less pressure, but uh, that gives you less parasite drag, but you need a higher angle of attack at lower speeds, so you have more induced drag. And the net change, when you draw that out, is simply this. It shifts to the right. Now, if we look for those two tangent points, you can see there's our sea level um, best range speed. Here's our high altitude, maybe 35 or 40,000 feet best range speed. So there's two things to notice here. Number one, it's much faster, right? It's a much faster velocity, but it's essentially the exact same thrust required. And that's a really interesting thing about a jet is you climb an altitude because of the changes in air density and the changes that that causes to the drag curve, your best range speed happens at a much faster true airspeed. But it happens at the exact same amount of thrust required, or roughly this, the, basically the same amount of thrust required. And so the cool thing about that is it doesn't take any more gas uh, to keep the airplane in level flight or fuel. It doesn't take any more jet fuel, but you are moving a lot faster. And so really a jet at altitude can get almost double the range oftentimes than a jet at sea level. So when you look at jet-powered aircraft, they're always up high. They want to be up high because their range goes up massively when they're up high. And one of the problems, like if you're going into somewhere like Chicago where they tend to drop people down early on arrival, I've seen people down at 9,000 feet, you know, hundreds of miles away. Um, it's kind of funny when you're 100 miles south of Chicago in a Cirrus at 16,000 and you watch a regional jet cru cruising under you at 10 um, on its way into Chicago because you know that their range has just come way down and they're sucking a lot more fuel to essentially fly. And, and so when a jet is forced to descend early, uh, one of the big things is, do I have enough fuel to still make it to my destination? Because my fuel consumption is going to go through the roof. Uh, and new jet pilots, especially single pilot jet pilots, that's an issue that they're not used to. And here's why. Props, as we said, are power producing airplanes, not thrust producing airplanes. So when we look at a prop driven airplane in cruise, we do not look at the thrust required chart. We need to look at the power required chart. And the way we get that, I'm gonna go uh, back to this. So we'll jump back into the iPad here. The way you get the power required chart is you simply take the drag curve and you take each point on the drag curve and you multiply the amount of drag or thrust required by the velocity. Okay, so thrust times velocity equals power. And that draws out your power curve. So that's what a prop-driven airplane, whether it's a turboprop or a reciprocating um, engine airplane, it's going to use this power curve. They look the same kind of, but it's a bit more of a J shape. But when we go to find our best range speed, we do the exact same thing. We start at the origin and draw a line. Now, the interesting thing uh, in a uh, prop-driven airplane, because this is a power curve, this actually happens to be LD max. And so it's slower. But let's take a look at what happens as altitude increases. Because we're at LD max, the power curve shifts up and to the right, okay, which does result in increased velocity. We're moving faster at our best range speed by far, okay, but it takes more power. And the problem with a power, in fact, you'll notice that curve changes so that LD max moves right along the tangent line. It stays right on that tangent line and just shifts up and to the right. And so the problem with the prop airplane as it climbs is while you're definitely going a lot faster, you're also using a lot more power. And so prop aircraft, because their fuel consumption is directly related to power, 
as they go higher, they go faster, but you're pumping more fuel, you're pumping more gas or, or jet A into a turboprop engine. And so you go farther, or sorry, you go faster, but you don't end up going any farther. In fact, essentially, your range remains the exact same at altitude as it would at sea level. The only thing that could change that then would be wind. That has a huge effect. And that's one of the reasons, like in a turbocharged Cirrus, we typically like to fly high because we can catch huge tailwinds. But other times, we'll stay down low because we can avoid a strong headwind. Um, and then there are some propeller and engine efficiencies that can make small changes at altitude. But really, in a propeller-driven airplane, when you go high or low, when you factor out the wind, range stays the same. It's just that speed increases when you're high. Jet, as you go up, your range explodes. You can almost double your range sometimes when you go up to your optimal altitude. And so that's why prop aircraft are often hanging down low. Not just the fact that it's hard to get high, we don't have the range advantage. But a jet, it's always moving up high. Okay, so there are a couple other things that really help out with a jet when it ends up at high altitude. Uh, and it drives the efficiency of a jet engine. So let's take a look at the first one. Um, and that is gonna be specific fuel consumption. Okay, so this is a term a lot of people probably haven't thought about. And um, specific fuel consumption, before we jump into the chart, it basically is just measuring the amount of fuel needed to produce one unit of thrust. So when we talk about specific fuel consumption in a jet, or SFC, we're asking, okay, how many units of fuel do you have to dump in to get one unit of thrust? And so we're gonna look at this as just kind of like one is the best number, and if it goes, or one unit is kind of our baseline number today, and then and if it goes up, that means you're dumping in more fuel, and if it goes down from that, then it means you're dumping in less fuel to get the same amount of thrust. Obviously, less fuel for the same amount of thrust means that the engine is operating more efficiently, you've got better range. So let's take a look at that. So when we look at altitude and specific fuel consumption, let's say it's one at sea level. As we climb, it's consuming essentially less fuel. The higher we go, the less fuel the engine needs to consume to generate the same amount of thrust until we reach a tropopause. And there it kind of levels out and then it gets warmer. And the reason that's the case is because this is both an altitude chart, but it's also a temperature chart. As you climb, you're going to decrease, in the troposphere, you're going to decrease your temperature. It's getting colder, right? So, you know, you might start here at 15 and you end here at negative 30. And as you go through the tropopause, that temperature stabilizes. And then in the stratosphere, it's going to start, start to warm up again. So it might be negative 15 up here. I mean, it's still really cold, but it does start to warm up. And jet engines are more efficient when they're burning cold air. And so the reason that is, is when we stick in one unit of fuel and expand it, if we do that in warm air, you get less expansion than if we do that in cold air. So you take one pound of jet fuel, you, uh, you mix it with compressed cold air, you know, maybe from the Arctic Circle, and it's gonna expand a lot more in the engine than if you mix it with really warm air. So essentially, to achieve that maximum amount of expansion when, when the air is really cold, it doesn't take quite as much fuel. Okay, looks like we got a question. Yeah, we had a good question here, and that is, uh, can jet engines work over the tropopause? Absolutely. Um, and if you look a lot of fighter aircraft and uh, modern aircraft are optimal a little bit lower. When I say modern aircraft, a lot of the jets that you fly in, the 737s and all, they're, they're, their optimal altitudes are a little bit lower than they used to be. Um, you know, back in the 60s when everything was turbojet as opposed to turbofan powered, uh, aircraft, uh, aircraft would op uh, operate in the stratosphere. Um, and they absolutely can. At some point in time, you're not going to have enough air to move through the engine to keep it both cool and to generate enough compression. And essentially, you really probably can't ever get a jet engine down to the point where it's producing zero thrust because it's using all of that air around it to cool it as well. And at some point in time, there's not enough airflow to cool it. The air is too dense and it's gonna overheat. And so um, 
but they sure can go into the stratosphere. It's just once that, that density gets too low, you're in trouble. And if you look at older engines, they actually are higher, uh, higher fuel consumption, higher altitude uh, than modern engines, modern aircraft. Now, again, some of the business jets like the Gulfstreams end up really, really high. Um, and it's kind of a generalization, but especially with airliners. I mean, you'll see that um, the engines are a little bit more efficient, but they're lower powered and lower altitude. Okay, let's take a look. Um, we looked at specific fuel consumption with temperature. And what we know is as it gets colder, that unit of fuel creates more expansion. So you're going to get more thrust out of every unit of fuel. So cold air is better. But there's also a factor that factors in with fan speed. So let's take a look um, at... We're going to take a look at specific fuel consumption in N1. So let's jump to the iPad. Okay, so N1 is the, uh, the essentially the, the fan speed or compress the first stage fan speed. Um, and it's rated in a percent, up to 100%. So you're not really watching RPMs, you're watching, uh, you're watching the percent. But what you'll find is you start to speed up the engine. It spins faster. Fuel consumption starts to drop per pound of thrust generated. And jet engines are the most efficient when they're operating basically right around 100% of N1. And you know, this, this kind of levels out as we get close, but it's really bad back here when you're in the, the very low RPM settings. So if we're operating, if we're spinning those compressors in the fan right about 100% or as close to 100% as possible, we're gonna end up burning less fuel to generate one pound of thrust. And so if we look at that in an efficiency chart, you can take specific fuel consumption and just turn it into efficiency, okay? Essentially, as we start to spin the engine faster, our efficiency on the engine starts to increase. But again, there's a problem when it comes down to a jet engine because you can't always spin it at its peak N1. You can't always get to that 100% efficiency. And that's because essentially when we're down low, if you ran it at 100% and one, you'd be compressing the air so much that you would exceed a limitation on the engine. So as we start to climb, you'll allow the N1 to start to increase, right? Because as you get higher and higher and higher, the density ends up becoming lower and lower and lower. So this is, you know, dense air here, and you end up with thin air at high altitude. And so now we can start to spin the engine faster and faster and faster so that it's operating more efficient, efficiently to compress that air. Okay, looks like we got another question. Okay, next question here is from Joshua. He wants to know, do turbojets work better than turbofans at higher altitudes? Generally, you could say yes. And I mean, they end up at higher altitudes than, than a turbofan. And so um, that's why you would see older turbojet powered aircraft operating typically at higher altitudes. But there's lots of technology that's gone into the fan that also gets it up to a high altitude and maintains efficiency. You know, when you look at the, the turbojet, essentially it was just a very, very pure jet, uh, not a blend of a jet and not really a prop, but a power producing airplane. Um, and so because of that, the fuel efficiency could vary wildly, uh, but they, they absolutely could get very, very high. And when people look at, you know, okay, why have we moved away from that? It's because fans are by far more efficient at putting out thrust. And so you see everything, and even the F-16 has a turbofan engine because it's so much more effective at producing thrust and it can get extremely high at the same time. So, you know, when you say, when we say, is one better than the other at high altitudes? Yes and no. I mean, a modern fan can get really, really high, but the old school turbojet compared to a basic fan, you know, the concept was, yes, they would perform a little bit better at altitude, but they burned a lot more fuel and they were not nearly as efficient. And fuel is kind of the big thing when you think about it with an airline, fuel is a major cost. And so the engines and their efficiency are a huge cause for concern. Um, okay, looks like we have another question. Okay, next up we got one from Sean and he wants to know, is there a temperature that's too low to support combustion in flight? 
Um, there are temperatures that can cause problems with jet fuel gelling and, and not necessarily you know, being thin enough. And so there's different kinds of jet fuels uh, that are developed for starting in really cold temperatures. Uh, the military used to use different kinds of jet fuels. But in general, um, part of it also is um, the fuel is essentially warmed by oil on most jets. Uh, you basically have a heat exchanger because the oil is hot from all the friction. Well, that basically runs around the fuel coils to heat the fuel lines as they go into the jet. So, so even though the jet's flying maybe negative 50, the fuel is warmed up before it hits the engine. But absolutely, you know, it, jet fuel is basically kerosene and, and um it's gonna to start to get a little bit more jelly as it cools down. If you've ever owned a diesel truck, diesel fuel and jet fuel are essentially the same thing. Jet fuel has different additives, but they are basically the same thing. They're kerosene. Um, and if you've ever left a, a diesel pickup truck out in the cold, um, I had one when I was in college, and when it was negative 40, that fuel was gelled, and there was nothing you could do to get it moving. So yeah, it, it can be a factor, but the fuel is heated typically as it makes its way into the engine. That's how they kind of handle that. Um, going back to this, going back to the um, flat rated thrust with altitude, you know, what you can see is the higher you go, the faster you can spin the RPMs. So the higher we go, RPMs end up going up. And the temperature drops, so the engine is much more efficient. But the problem is, your thrust is still decreasing. Even though the engine is efficient, our maximum thrust output is starting to drop. We're burning less jet fuel, but at some point in time, the maximum output of the engine might drop below what we need. And so that comes down to this. And this is the turbojet ceiling kind of a chart. So we've got a couple lines here we're gonna walk through, one of which is our slow speed stall. And as you get higher, the air is less dense, so the stall speed in true air speed increases. Okay, so our stall speed gets faster. But because the speed of sound is temperature dependent, it gets slower as you get to altitude. At some point in time, your slow speed stall and your overspeed or your Mach buffet will meet. And, and if you think about, um, the speed of sound. It's transmitting energy through the air. And the more energy the air molecules have, the faster that sound or air pressure can move. Well, when a gas is warmer, it's got more energy. It's bouncing around faster. It transmits pressure waves or sound faster. Sound is just basically pressure waves. So as we get higher and that temperature starts to cool down, it's not that the air is less dense, it's that it's not moving as much. It has less energy. And so, the speed of sound starts to slow down. So going back to this chart, at some point in time, you end up in what they used to call coffin corner. And coffin corner was essentially the point where if you got, you could be flying right here. And if you lost five knots, you'd stall because you were too slow. If you gained five knots, somewhere on the airplane, maybe on the wing or on the fuselage or on the tail, the airflow would accelerate just enough to approach the speed of sound. And that generates a large shock wave and causes a buffet and controllability issues. So basically, uh, old jets, you know, 727s, jets developed in the 60s and 50s, they could get really close to this coffin corner where they had a very tiny margin between stalling out in cruise and overspeeding in a Mach Buffet. And that's because this green line, this is an old school turbojet uh, thrust line with altitude. You can see it's dropping. Um, it's steeper than overspeed. So, you know, at lower altitudes, there's no way that that airliner could even get close to overspeed in level flight. But then all of a sudden, in high altitudes, because the speed of sound has dropped so much, it's got enough thrust that the old school airliners could end up in a mock buffet, and if they slow down too much, they could end up in a stall. That was kind of uh, the, the traditional turbojet days. That's not an issue as much anymore, especially with modern jet aircraft. And that's because we say that these aircraft are thrust limited. Remember efficiency is such a big deal these days. They might be flat rated to a point and then they're going to lose thrust as they climb, just like an old school turbojet would, but they're never going to have enough thrust, many times they won't, to get to the overspeed in level flight. Or you know, they might be able to get there, but there's not that much thrust available. However, at some point in time, 
they'll run out of thrust and they'll end up at their slow speed stall. So they're not producing zero thrust. They're just at the point where their, their thrust is gonna start to drop below thrust required for level flight. Okay, so here's the problem with this. Remember that thrust at high altitude is all related to air density. So if air density starts to decrease, all of a sudden um, thrust is gonna decrease. The other problem that we have is even if we can compress the air enough to maintain the thrust we need, if we start to heat the incoming air as it enters the engine or enters the, the turbine or the, the compressors, you can't compress it as much anymore because it's already kind of warm and it's gonna, you're limiting the compression because you still got to keep below that turbine inlet temperature at the end. So the warmer the air is as it enters the engine, the less you can compress it. So the problem that you run into at high altitudes, near that optimal uh, turbofan or turbojet ceiling on a thrust limited airplane, is that as the temperature warms up, the air becomes less dense and you can't compress it as much because you're gonna end up running into your turbine inlet temperature, your turbine inlet temperature. And at that point in time, now the aircraft's gonna end up in a stall. So if you watch what happens here, and we walk our way through it, as the temperature starts to warm up, what you're gonna find is that the thrust output of the engine starts to decrease. And so let's say we're flying at our altitude really high right here, okay? And we enter it in fairly cold air. Well, we've got lots of thrust available. This isn't a problem. But we start to fly into a warmer air mass. We cross into a warm front. You don't feel anything. You don't notice anything. It's just that the OAT starts creeping up. This is what's happening to the thrust output of your engine. And at some point in time, you can end up right there, where you end up in a slow speed stall. Now, this has become an issue. It's part of the ATP, CTP training that you'll take if you go to an airline. Uh, these high altitude, slow speed events that you hear about, this is what causes them. You're in level flight, autopilot's running, and the temp and you're, really, you're at your optimum altitude, really close, essentially, um, to that thrust limited ceiling. And as the temperature starts to warm up, engine power output starts to drop because it can't compress it as much as the lower density and and it's temperature limited now because you have warmer air entering. And at some point in time, you'll find that that thrust line matches your thrust required at your altitude. And what was a fine cruise speed results in a stick shaker uh, at cruise altitude. So um, that's one of the hazards when you start to look at high altitude flight. Okay, looks like we got another question. Okay, next up here for Mateus, he wants to know, does the SFC versus RPM curve suggest that the maximum economy of a turbojet can be achieved at or close to the engine operating limit? It's exactly what they call normal. So when we call the normal N1, that doesn't mean normal because you operate there. Normal is just the, kind of the physics or the engineering term for 100% of N1. And you're exactly right. Uh, I'll pull that curve up again, but you're exactly right. When we look at the specific fuel consumption and we start to get faster and faster N1, the engine is more and more efficient. And so just looking at N1, your efficiency is going to be kind of peak or the N1 part of efficiency will be peak right about 100% of N1. Now, of course, Keep in mind, there's other factors, as I said, that, that, that factor in there, um, like air density, and that isn't necessarily saying that we're at 100% of power output, because even at 100% of N1, depending on the density of air going in, you're not necessarily at 100% of power output. It's just kind of that 100% that spin speed. Um, that's that's going to increase your efficiency. Okay, looks like we have another question. Okay, we got time for one last question here, and that comes from Bruno, and he wants to know, will the max range speed always work together with the best cost index, or do they vary? This is a great question. Um, and remember at the beginning I said, you know, no one really flies at best range anymore, especially prop airplanes, and there's a reason. It's at LD Max. There's no way I'm going to fly around at 92 or 97 or something in the Cirrus. That's ridiculous. Uh, and in a jet, you actually fly pretty close to best range but not exactly at best range. And it comes down to a couple terms, one of which is long range, crew, long range cruise, or LRC. The other one is cost index. So let's take a look at both of those. We're gonna to go, to um, we'll go to the jet range diagram. 
Okay, and I'm gonna clear this out. And if you take a look at maximum range right here, okay, this is peak range. But if we trade 1% of our fuel efficiency, so we're 99% efficient, if we use 1% more fuel, we'll get three to 5% faster airspeed. So yeah, we're burning a little more fuel, but we're going much faster. This speed is called LRC, we're long range crews. So that used to be the speed that everybody would fly at. It wasn't much more fuel burn, but it was enough to give you an airspeed increase. But okay, today we're ultra sensitive to fuel prices. So let's just grab, let's kind of zoom in on this. So we'll zoom in here. If I draw this curve out, okay, you're gonna have your best range right there. And then about with a percent more fuel burn, you're gonna have LRC right here. The middle of this is your cost index. So the concept of cost index is that essentially there are two factors to operating the airplane when it comes to cost. The cost of the fuel and then the cost of your hourly variables. And so your hourly variables could be what you're paying the crew. Um, you may have the aircraft on a maintenance plan where the airplane's maintenance is billed per flight hour. Uh, the lease may be per flight hour. The engine lease may be per flight hour. So those are all hourly variable costs. And so you've got to balance how expensive your fuel is versus all of those hourly variable costs. How much you're paying the crew. Um, if you've got an hourly lease on the airplane, what that cost is. It, in, you know, airlines have a variety of different lease options, but they could very much be like what it would be like renting an airplane. There's an hourly cost to the airplane. Um, and, and that right there, the longer in the air, the more you're gonna pay. So what happens is for cost index, we'll jump back to the iPad. Essentially what you do is you take your hourly cost over your fuel cost and that results in an index. Low numbers mean fuel is really expensive. And so you end up at low cost indexes, which are really close to best range. And when your hourly costs in the airplane get really high, you'll end up flying much faster towards long range crews. And companies like Boeing um, and performance companies will actually study in operation. They'll study the aircraft, they'll study uh, the ATC signed routes and altitudes, they'll uh, study the cost of fuel at destinations, and they'll actually figure out what they call the optimum cost index for a flight. So when we hear about cost index, um, sometimes it's just something they're kind of guesstimating at, other times it's done with a lot of data analysis, and they go, okay, based off today's fuel cost and our contracts and all that, this is where we need to be for the perfect break even. But when you talk about what affects cost index, anything that affects best range, because cost index, best range, long range crews, they are all affected by the exact same factors. Okay, uh, that's all the time we got tonight. I hope uh, you guys learned something and, and uh, you enjoyed this. There's a link in the description to let us know your comments and we'll have another one of these in two weeks. So let us know what you'd like us to talk about. Hope to see you then, good night.